It's good to be in the house of the Lord. If you got your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to get into this this morning. Very familiar passage, chapter 3. This is NIV for whoever's back there. Can't I think it's Jenny. Yes, my sister Jenny's back there. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. <clears throat> now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I like that. I like freedom. I like what freedom represents. I don't know if there's anyone in this room, you're like, you know what, freedom's good. Freedom's a good thing. Freedom's a good thing in your life, in your family, in a country. Freedom is a good thing. It's something that we should want in our life. I don't think people walk around like, you know, I kind of like being in bondage. Freedom is good. Right, Brandon? It's a good thing. And I love here because Paul is declaring where the spirit of the Lord is, where the presence and the glory of God is being manifested, there will be freedom. There will be transformation. There will be things happening. People will be walking in victory. Things will be taking place. Transformation and change is going to be happening where we see the spirit of the God coming down. You're going to see freedom and change and transformation. And this is what I desperately want to see in my life, my family, my church family, those here, those you're watching right now. I want to see us walking in freedom. Not pretend freedom. Not throwing on our Sunday morning freedom. I mean real freedom. Real transformation. Where we are the people of God that are walking in some real victory. Now listen, I know that we might not always see all kinds of victory out around us. There's things that come at us, right? You might go through some financial things. <clears throat> Man, that, that happy birthday song, Merle. <clears throat> Took it out of my voice a little bit here. <laughs> I'll have to suck it up here. You might deal with some health situations that come. I'm going to need a lot more uh, in the monitor. Or I'm going to blow my voice. I'm going to be done in five minutes here. And so sometimes we think about like, hey, we got to have absolute victory in all these areas outside. And things come, battles come. I'm not talking necessarily about that. I'm talking about right here. Like you got some real victory on the inside of you, some real freedom, some real transformation, and, and not just a temporary freedom, but some sustained freedom, some lasting transformation on the inside. And as you read the Word of God, you'll find that this is, a, this is kind of the expectation for our lives, those who are followers of Jesus, those who have given their life to Jesus, those who have received forgiveness and the blood of Jesus, right? What do you read? It's kind of the expectation that you have a people walking in this freedom, walking in this victory, walking as transformed people. Like there's things not still plaguing their lives and they're not still in bondage and, and strongholds on the inside that there's something that has happened. On the inside, that is the expectation. And yet, what do you do? If you came in here this morning, what do we do? If we come in this morning and, you know what? If you're honest, you're like, I'm not really free in my life. There's areas of my life that are not quite free. They haven't been transformed. There's things I'm still struggling with. There's some things you walked in, you still got some chains. And I think we're okay with that if this is like your first service. We kind of know what to do. Well, give your life to Jesus. You, you're not, you haven't been born again, so that's what you need to do. But what happened? this isn't your first service? What happened? you've been a believer? You know the expectation. You know what's, what is possible. But yet, if you, you're honest, you look in, you're like, I still got some 
things going on on the inside of me. There's still some areas in my life that need to be transformed. Maybe you're in here and you have some unforgiveness on the inside of you. That's not freedom. Maybe you come, it's not that you don't love Jesus, you're here, you're worshiping, you're, but yet throughout the week or months or maybe it's been your life, you deal with what the Bible talks about like rage or fits of anger. Like just this angry and fits and just like this thing that's just riles up and comes up and, and it explodes everywhere around you. That's not freedom. Maybe you're a believer, you're a Christian, but yet you're being just ruled and dominated by the spirit of lust, pornography, or other kinds of addictions. Guess what? That's not freedom. We can shout about, there's, we can sing about where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, we dance, we do the things, but yet so many people come in and they're not free. They haven't had this transformation happen on the inside. They're dealing with addictions. Maybe you're operating in strife, envy, jealousy. Guess what? None of that speaks to like victory on the inside. None of that feels like freedom, right? When you, when you wake up and you want to start living, it's like, ugh. And I want us to live. I want us to have freedom. I want us to be able to wake up in our, in our homes and our families or as an individual and have some real freedom. And yet, we have these things that don't really feel like freedom happening in our lives. What do we do? And some of you are like, you know what? I got some of those big things cleaned up. I don't have any major addictions. And you can get in church for a while. This is probably even a, a worse stronghold. You just... Something has come in, and your heart has just become complacent, lethargic, dull. You've been gripped by apathy. See, that's a clean stronghold. That's a polished out little thing, right? It's acceptable. That bondage is acceptable in most churches a heart that's become complacent, apathetic, and lethargic. But yet, what is it? It's not freedom. It's not freedom. Right? You're trying to live life. You're trying to live life for the people around you. You're trying to have that heart, you know, really alive like the Bible promises that we're supposed to have life and life to the fullest. And yet something's gripped your heart that's caused you to become dull or lethargic or complacent. And you're not free. And you're not free. And I, I want the church, I want my friends, my family, like we can actually live free. But what do you do? You're like, okay. Maybe there's things that you haven't even done that have been done to you. Traumas and situations. And, and it's caused different things. It's caused torment in your mind and, and it's caused different things in your heart. What do you do with these things? We want to have freedom. We want to live life. But what do we do? And maybe you're here and you say, I've gave my life to Jesus, but I'm not walking a lot of victory or freedom and I don't feel like I'm changing much anymore. Well, this is the point in religion and church, and I've probably been guilty of it myself, is where we love to give you a, a good list of rules. Oh, we love rules. I mean, religion really has been built on the rules, right? No, we act like we don't. But like, okay, I'm not free. I got this going on. I got lust in my life. What should I do? Well, stop lusting. Okay, I got anger in my, in my life. What should I do? Stop being angry. I got envy or bitterness. We'll just stop doing that. Don't do this. Don't do that. That's our answer, right? I'm thinking about the church at large, right? For years, all the rules. You become a Christian, what? Don't drink, don't cuss, don't smoke. 
Don't dance in some circles. Don't dance. Don't play cards. I'm trying to think of some other. Don't go to movies. <laughs> right? Some of you guys have been around this one. Don't have chrome on your vehicles. That's like a Pentecostal holy. I, I don't know which group that is. The Am I don't know. There's a whole group. Don't have chrome. And I, I think it's because like chrome on your car is like you're living haughty or prideful or I don't know. I think that's probably the intention of it, you know. Like not having chromes don't really fix that situation. But some of you though, I think, I think Hanson's like you guys, you guys got a vehicle that's all blacked out, right? That's cool. Right, it's all blacked out, got the blacked out wheels. I've seen it, it's a nice SUV, all blacked out. You didn't even know how Pentecostal holy you were. <laughs> but I had a thought here though, like, if having an all blacked out car is now the cool thing, do thou, the, that group now get chrome? Like, no, hey, I know you had blacked out bumpers, but now that's cool. Uh, so now I need you to get Chrome, or so I don't know what they do with that. <laughs> but you get my point, right? We just give a list of rules, and we do it through our sermons, we do it through all kinds of different ways, and the rules are not necessarily bad. But here's the problem. If you were a drug addict and you came in here, and if you are, we're going to get some help for you today uh, because I was one and, and I, I'm not anymore. So that's good news for you. <laughs> like, thank you. You're preaching. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the problem with this. If you're a drug addict, you came into church here today, sang the songs, giving your life to Jesus. And you're coming to me and, Pastor, I'm on drugs. What do I need to do? And I look at you and say, you know what? Just stop doing drugs. I give him a rule. Just stop doing drugs. What is he going to look at? He's going to look at me like, brother, if I could, I would. Think about all the bond, all the things. If I could, I would. And this is what the problem is. After that, most churches in our current religion, we don't have much more to offer past the rules. Now, we've modernized it now in our churches, so we don't just call them rules. We call them steps. Five, seven steps to being a better dad, being not such a jerk, seven steps to being a better wife. Just rules and rules. And, hey, here's the six steps to get off drugs. Rules, 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 right? And what happens is we get saved, and then we join a church, and we get into this like 30 to 40 year program of trying to keep the list. Some of you are better at it than others. Some of you are rule followers. So you're a little bit better. I'm not a rule follower. <laughs> They're like, we kind of got that. Yeah. So that wasn't going to work for me. Some of you are better rule followers, so maybe you're better at showing that you're following the rules. But this is what I found about some of you rule followers. You tend to be very self-righteous, which, which is a bondage in itself and not very freeing. <laughs> You're like, oh, shoot. I, even, I kept some of those rules. You kept the rules that you know that everyone looks. And as you get older, you just get better at hiding the rules you're not following. So the rules don't work. Listen to, well, think about this. I have one other thing. Think about this. If you're here today and you have a root of bitterness, okay, like a, just a root of bitterness, and I look at you and I say, you know what? Stop being bitter. One, I'm probably getting slapped. <laughs> like that's what's going to happen with someone that has bitterness and you, you confront them like that. But you think that's going to help them? Hey, I got a root of bitterness. I'm bitter. I'm bitter. I'm bitter. And I just look at you and say, stop being bitter. They're probably going to get more angry and what? More. Listen to what Paul writes to the Colossians in chapter 2 and verse 20. This is New Living Translation. Chapter 2, verse 20. Paul writes this. You have died with Christ, 
and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. Verse 23, these rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. And here's the key. Here's the line right here. Listen to this. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Now, obviously, in context, he's dealing with some... Jewish legalism, he's doing, they, they had some Hellenistic Gnosticism that they're dealing with, and they had all kinds of stuff, and they're having all these different rules. But the line here that I think is so powerful, that if you want to be free, you want to live not just free, but sustained freedom, like lasting transformation in your life, you need to understand this. He said this about the rules. They provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires they're powerless rules are powerless he says it this way in romans 8 3 a little bit different he said for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh god did by sending his own son so what's he saying laws and rules have no power to transform you have no power to redeem you all they do is reveal your guilt. That's the law came, right? To reveal our guilt. To show us that we have all fallen short and that we're all guilty. That's what the law does. But it doesn't transform. It doesn't change. It doesn't redeem. The law in itself is not bad. There's nothing bad about the law or rules. But they do not have the power to change so if i go to the courtroom for example i get in trouble i have to go to court okay i walk in there what does the law do the law tells me they take my actions they put it next to that rule that law and it tells me that i did something wrong it tells me you are guilty you broke this rule this law but that law has nothing, it does nothing to do to redeem my situation, change me as a person. It just tells me I did something wrong. We have to understand this about rules and the law. And in religion, think about it. Some of you guys with walks, maybe some revelations that will come to some of you here. We come into church. We got stuff going on, we hear a sermon, we hear stuff, we read something, we get told something, we, give, we get the rule given to us, J.D. We might even do a really good effort to try to keep that rule this week. But eventually, a lot of you and a lot of me <laughs> fail at that rule. We mess up in that rule, which says that now we're guilty. And that produces a shame on our life. And if rules and laws can't transform you, I guarantee you shame really can't change you. Like I found this about shame. Shame tends to double down on your issues. It causes people to spiral. It doesn't pull them up. It actually digs a deeper hole. I heard about your mess, by the way. If you didn't, Brooke, you did an awesome job, phenomenal job. My wife has talked to me two different times this week about your message on Wednesday, you really your testimony and sharing uh, powerful things. So I just want to just, that was awesome. For those of you who are here on Wednesday, great. Don't, you missed. Missed out, I'm sorry. Uh, but you end up digging yourself a deeper hole. That shame does not produce change. So what happens, think about this. We come to church, we know we got some bondage, we got some things that need to be changed and transformed in our life. We got strife or things ain't going right. We know we have to be free. We're supposed to be free, we're supposed to be transformed, we're supposed to be these people of God. We get the rule, we go back, we try to do it, we mess up, we get shame, shame has its course, and finally we get ourselves back into church 
to try to do it all over again. We get the next rule, we face it. And the cycle of religion just goes on and on. And that's why you can have people in church for 30 years and they have not been transformed. Because it doesn't work. The rules and the shame cycle, it does not work. So, if following rules doesn't bring freedom, what hope do we have? What do we do? If you're here right now, and there's probably all of us have some areas in our life that could use a little transformation, a little bit of freedom, right? But if you just walking out of here with a set of rules that you're gonna try to do better, how's that been working for you? I'm gonna, I need to stop doing X, Y, Z. I, I know that. I've been trying. See, here's the deal about following rules. You, you remember when Paul, catch that line, he says, they deteriorate as you use them. As a pastor and working with people, here's what I've come up with. If you get something like, hey, I need to stop doing X, Y, Z, for most people, that's about a 24 to 72 hour shelf life. And JD, I've been on the recipient of, oh man, that sermon really changed me. I gave him some really strong rules, you know, and like, stop doing this, stop doing that. Okay, okay, pastor, I'm gonna stop. And man, for 24 hours, 48 hours, they're on it, on it, on it, on it. And then like two weeks later, like, oh, pastor. And part of me, the pastor's like, what am I doing? <laughs> like we're in this system. Over and over, and I think, here's my suspicion, this is like really giving some insider information in the church world. I think some leaders like it, because why? Because they keep coming back. I'm sick, like inside my soul, I get a little bit of rule, a little, I'm gonna try to do it, but inevitably they don't fail by Saturday, so oh, I feel bad, what do I need? I need to get myself back to church, we're gonna try this all over again. That might work for the machine of church, but it's a far cry from what Jesus expected his church to be. He died on the cross that he could have some transformed people on the earth actually really free. Not temporary, not for like three or four days, but like something that happens in their life that they're not the same. They're a new creation. That they've been really transformed. So how do we do that? It's not rules. What is it? I'm going to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Again, I said, this where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Verse 18. Let's we'll start getting a clue here. And we all, and we all, who with unveiled faces... Beholding the glory of the Lord, or what? Are being transformed into his image. I think New Living Translation says, becoming more and more like him with an ever increasing glory. Did you see that? How are we transformed? It says this we with unveiled faces as we behold the glory of God. We are, we are being transformed. We are being changed. See, how do you get verse 17? You do verse 18. How do we get the freedom of verse 17? We do what it says in verse 18. We begin to behold the glory of the living God, the presence, the spirit. We begin to gaze upon the glory of God. And it says this, and you will be transformed. That's powerful. That's a lot different than a set of rules. That's a lot different than that. Hey, stop doing that. Stop doing that. He's like, hey, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. I'm telling you from not just scripture, from personal experience and testimony. The more you try to not do the thing, it seems like it even gets a stronger hold in you. Pastor Steve a long time ago preached a message called the power of no. 
As soon as we say no, what you want to do? I want to do it more. The recipe that Paul brings us for actual lasting transformation and sustained freedom, that as we behold the glory of God, as we experience the presence and the Spirit of God being poured out in our lives, as we behold His glory, something begins to change, Sam, on the inside. Something begins to transform on the inside. Freedom starts to come in on the inside. That which you are powerless to do in yourself. That which you can't do by just trying to be a better person. That which you can't do is just trying to try harder this week. Something else. And this is the gospel. This is what, what we're supposed to experience. Is that the glory of God would come in and start to rearrange us on the inside. And bring change. And that's not different than the rules. We are to behold the glory of God. What does that mean? It means to, to gaze upon, to meditate about, just to take in with our sight, with our, with our ears, to observe, right? To place your attention, to fix your thoughts, to look. That's what it means to behold something. We begin to turn our eyes off of ourselves. We begin to turn our eyes to him and we begin to behold the glory of God. We begin to fix our minds on it. We begin to gaze. Listen, we begin to stare at something other than ourselves. And this morning, with a little bit of time I got left here, I want to give us three practical ways to behold the glory of God. Because I can say, behold the glory of God, you're like, okay, thank you. What does that mean? I'm going to give three ways you can do that. And I'm hoping to give you, this is my hope and my prayer. I can do this good, but God's going to help me here. I want to give you guys something better than walking out of these doors saying just do better, try more. Just try harder. I want, I want to see freedom being released in this place. And so I want to give you three practical ways, some things that you can do Today, in this service, but as you go throughout this week, to begin to behold the glory of God. You guys got that? You guys believe that's an answer, possibly, to seeing transformation in your life? As we behold the glory of God, we are being transformed into his likeness. What does that mean? That the glory of God is going to actually transform you to be like Jesus. He's really free. <laughs> I mean, we talk about someone who walked in some freedom. He had no sin, Brennan. They had nothing competing on the inside. He had ultimate victory on the inside. And this is a promise. As I behold the glory of God, I'm being transformed from glory to glory to be more like him. That's the goal. That's the goal, to be more like him. So here's some things. All right, first, this might seem a little strange because I've been talking about rules. But we can behold the glory of God by looking upon or beholding his glory in the word of God. He's like, that seems like you're telling me to read rules. That's the problem with some of you. You're reading that book like it's just a set of rules you're supposed to try to do. It doesn't work that way. No, you need to behold the glory of God in it. The Bible talks about, you know, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? Renewing of our minds. The Word, and I think it's John chapter 1, the Word what? became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory. There's a glory in the Word of God. And a couple ways you can do this is you can begin to behold the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about Him? You're like, I don't know how to figure that out. Like, what is His attributes? about God and begin to meditate on it, begin to think about it, begin to look on it, begin to stare. What are the, there's this thing that you can use that can really help you. It's called Google. I have people like, I don't know how to like figure out all these things in the scripture. I'm like, you don't have to be a rocket science. I like Google because I can look up stuff. It's probably why I was able to become a pastor. If there was no Google, I wouldn't be a pastor. I'd be like, I'm, if that, you know those big books that you all had to do back in the day and 
Uh, what are those, the concordances? Yeah, that was not me. I'm not, I don't know if you ever picked that up about me, but I'm not a concordance type of guy. Uh, that's, and, but Google is like a faster concordance. I mean, like, it's like, you can, right? <laughs> what does the word about, say about him? You can find out that God is all-powerful, that God is all-knowing, that God is holy. That's Isaiah 6, 3. I have scriptures for all these. Guess what? You can too because all you have to do is do what? God is merciful. God is faithful. God is a provider. You, know, you begin to meditate on this. You begin to think about this. You begin to turn your attention and your heart towards who God is. God is a healer. Listen to this. God is love. I begin to just dwell on that. God is love. What does that mean? I begin to think about it. I begin to meditate. I begin to chew on that truth of the glory of God that he is love. He is merciful. He's all powerful. He's a provider. He's a healer. I begin to think and think and meditate. I begin to behold the glory of God. And as I do that, I allow that scripture to begin to resonate in me. And I begin to chew on that and chew on that and think about it. All of a sudden, something's happening on the inside of me. I'm becoming something different. Not just, all right, God, what am I supposed to do? I'm not doing that. Oh, okay, I'll try next tomorrow. Oh, shoot, I'm failing there too. Oh, gosh. It's like reading, you're just trying to read this thing like where you're all failing at. It don't work that way. What does the word say about him? What does the word say about you? Who you are in him? Some of you got all this junk and darkness and sin and addictions and strongholds. I mean, we can sit and talk about them and get you to just, hey, stop doing that, stop doing that. Or you can begin to, wait, hey, what does God say about me? Guess what I did? I went to, what did I go to on the internet? Yeah, I did that. Hey, give me a bunch of scriptures about who God says I am in him, in Christ. I found out that I'm a child of God. Just caveat, just so you don't think you're like a complete novice preacher here. I knew as a child of God before I Googled it this week. Okay, I knew that. I, did just, I just didn't learn that this week. But so, <laughs> but I mean, a dwell in this. I'm a child of God. I'm a new creation. I'm loved by God. I'm forgiven. I've been made an heir with Christ. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. I am victorious. I am God's workmanship. I am the light of the world. I begin to behold this glory that the word of God has spoken over my life and who I am in him. And I begin to meditate and I begin to stare at that. And as I do that, something is changing on the inside. So the first thing you can do is, listen, it's not a set of rules. Just begin to behold his word, what he says about him and what he says about you. Allow it to change you. That's first. Here's a second way. You're going to find out none of these are rules. It's the area of worship. What we just got done doing earlier today. Some people are like, why do you guys worship so, more, so much? Well, I'm going to explain why. You're going to get some understanding. So if you've been coming here for a while, and that's been a burning question uh, in your mind, like, is that ever going to change? If I have the power, it's never going to change, right? If anything, it's just going to go longer, okay? But that's, so maybe, like, well, we hope he doesn't ever get that authority. Uh, worship. As you praise him, as you sing, as you give thanksgiving, as you worship and adore him, as you begin to declare God's worth, is one of the most powerful ways that you can begin to behold the glory of God. And it's so beneficial. Here's why. Because it begins to turn your eyes off of yourself, off of your situations, and upon him. And you begin to behold the glory of God. You begin to turn your eyes off of that junk that you walked in here, off of the, the chains that you have maybe in your life. And you begin to turn it. And he's like, why do we have to go so long? Because it takes some of you some time. I can't get your eyes off yourself and off your problems in two songs. And if you're worshiping and you're learning how to worship correctly, biblically, then it's not just you listening to these guys sing some songs. Oh, well, here's another song. 
I mean, you're just sitting at a concert that you know half the songs. And typically in concerts, they don't do the bridge seven times. So I don't even know how that, if you're just listening like that, you're not getting the value of what we take 40 to 45 minutes every service to allow you to do something. To begin to turn your gaze off of yourself, begin to lift your heart and your mind and your attention up to the Lord. And this is how, my wife alluded to this earlier, this is how I've been changed. This is my testimony over the years. As I would get into this place, I'd begin to worship, and all of a sudden something would begin to change on the inside of me. i come in, maybe there's some strife in my marriage. You know, I could, I could come out and say, you know what, just be a better husband, don't have strife. You know what, that doesn't work! I knew that while I was in the strife. I knew I was being an idiot while I was being an idiot. But for some reason, I'm still being an idiot. No, what I needed is coming to church and begin to turn my eyes towards him and begin to behold the glory of God. And as I did, things would start to melt and I begin to get some freedom and transformation on the inside. And guess what? I walk out without any strife. What did I do? Nothing. I didn't do nothing besides look up. I was reading uh, this quote from the book. Uh, it's called Spiritual Depression. It's by an author called, his name is Martin Lloyd-Jones. Do you know this guy? <laughs> J.D., this is where J.D. knows all of it. This is why... If you guys don't know, he is a concordance guy. <laughs> Which I, I don't know him. I'm sorry, J.D. I'm, I'm a retrobate. I don't know what to tell you. You'll have to give me, give me the summary. Give me the synopsis sometime this next week, all right? Let me know how I've been completely clueless about this guy. I do appreciate J.D. because um, if I didn't have him in life, I might not even know how to preach out of this Bible, to be honest, because he actually taught me. I do want to honor this man because I was, well, one, here's why I know. I look back, I look back at some of my old youth sermons before I had JD help. Wow. <laughs> you know what it looked like? A guy that was just kind of getting out of drugs that got an opportunity to speak. That's kind of what it looked like, but, but I do thank you, thank you for that. Some of you are like, you still kind of look like that, but don't worry. That's another. But here's what he, this very famous preacher that we all know, he wrote this. There's only one way to get rid of self, which is what we're trying to do. That's freedom, right? And that is that you should become so absorbed in someone or something else that you have no time to think about yourself. He goes on and says this. Some introspection can be healthy. Okay, so he's not just completely thrown away. But as it's been said before, listen to this. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. There's a good ratio for some of you mathematicians out here. For every look at self, take 10 looks at Christ. That's worship. That's what we're doing. We're gazing directly into the eyes of God. And we are beholding something. I learned this early on. So I knew I couldn't keep up the rules. My life had already decided that, all right? I'm not that guy. But I learned this powerful truth, J.D. I will become what I behold. I will become whatever I behold. And that's the truth for everyone. We will become whatever we behold. This is why staring at our sins is not ideal. This is you, why you coming in and tell me all your problems and all your sins and why you're still not free. We can have a five minute talk, but we don't have to have a 50 minute talk about Christ, right? We gotta keep that ratio, right? Worship puts you in a position to begin to behold the glory, glory of God to be changed. So if you're not seeing transformation, 
and change in your life, maybe you're staring at the wrong thing. So spend some time worshiping. All right, here's my last one. I got to hurry up. Are any of you guys okay if you get out at 12.05? Okay. Somebody, someone just got up. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to be, I'll be quick here. This one is a little bit more of the direct way this helps. Thank you, guys. If they come up here, that makes me go faster. This last way is a little bit more of a direct way of beholding the glory of God. It's the one that religion has a little harder time with. Religion I have a hard time with talking about the word of God. It's okay with worship as long as it's not 45 minutes. You can handle that. But, but this way, it gets really nervous. And that is that we can behold the glory of God by having an encounter with the glory of God. People encountering and experiencing the glory of God is probably one of the quickest, fastest ways to see transformation in your life. This is my testimony. So how'd you get off of drugs? I had an encounter with the glory of God. Some of you, you've been struggling, you just haven't had an encounter. Or maybe you need another encounter. You can have more than one in life. It's okay. But to encounter, you behold, I mean, that's really beholding him. But to begin to encounter the power and the glory of God. And like I said, and maybe you grew up, a lot of religion and even people get really nervous about this. What do you mean encountering the power and glory of God? Oh, what is that? That's a little bit weird. You know what's weird? Your addiction to pornography. You know what's weird? That you're still bitter. That's weird. That's what you should be nervous about. I'm not condemning you about that. I'm just, and I'm not saying anything about that. I'm just saying that's what you should be nervous about. That's the glory of God coming down and people encountering the power and the presence of God. The fact that that's weird in church says a lot about the American church. These should go hand in hand. I'm a little nervous. What is that going to look like? What am I going to feel? Why are you so nervous? What are you afraid of? You ain't got freedom on the inside. You're, you're bound. You got strife. You're angry. You got, you know, do you ever like, when you get that fits of rage, like, oh, that was weird. No. Like, oh, this is who I am. This is not weird. Not strange. This is biblical. Look at, you look at all these people we admire in the Bible. Look at Peter. He's a fraidy cat. Scared of a little girl. Denying Jesus, he gets in the upper room, the Spirit of God falls down, the power of God comes on him, right? He gets filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's out preaching right away in the face of death. What happened? Well, it wasn't a 30-year rule list. He encountered something. And I'm sorry that this has been robbed from the church. We don't have 30, 40 years for some of you. You need to start getting changed now, free now. I want to read this. To close up, the Apostle Paul, you were talking about how much you love Paul. Well, Paul was once Saul. He wasn't a cool guy back then. We've heard about the Damascus Road, right? Some of you haven't read it for a while. I want to read it. Chapter 9, this is NIV. Verse 1, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. That, that don't sound free at all. I mean, if you got murder, the one rule I was able to keep before I was a Christian was I never murdered anybody. And someone said, well, all right. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way or who were Christians, whether men or women, 
he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. This is a guy that's not a really good guy. He's seen people being killed for being Christians. It says here he's still, why he's still, this is why he is still breathing murderous threats. I don't know what kind of situation he walked in, but this is Paul. He is still breathing, thinking, contemplating murderous threats. And he's on this road. And in verse 3 it says this. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. That's the glory of God, right? And he fell to the ground. I don't know how many times I've been asked. We empower God movement. People fall to the ground like, where is that in the Bible, pastor? I'm like, even if it wasn't in the Bible, if people are getting free and set free, why do you care? What is your problem? Anyway, I'm like, your marriage is hanging by a, a thread and you're so nervous about someone falling to a ground? I mean, you're about ready to lose your marriage. You've been dealing with that, that addiction for how many years? But, uh, hey, Pastor, where's that in the Bible? What's in there? Acts 9. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him, and he fell to the ground. That was not like, just like spiritually fell to the ground. Okay? He physically fell to the ground. Now, I don't care if anyone falls to the ground. I can't, you can, people that fall to the ground for whatever reason, I don't know. It might be just a religion. I'm not talking about that. But what I do want to have happen is that suddenly the light and the glory and the presence of God would come into this room and have happened what happened to Paul. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He was smart enough to say, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, who are you persecuting? The best thing you can do for freedom and transformation in your life is to encounter it's what changed my life and what continues to change my life is to encounter and to behold the glory of God I don't know how it happens I don't know what's all taking place all I do know is this I one time was addicted to drugs. And I encountered the power of God. One moment. And I've never had a desire for over 25 years. I have been, I have sustained freedom. I have had lasting transformation. And what I want to see in this place is I want to see some things maybe you've been struggling with. Maybe there's that apathy or maybe there's some strife or maybe there's some addictions or some darkness or some things, you know you're not quite free. I'm not telling you, hey, go do better. I say, hey, can we, as a church, spend a little bit of time here this morning? We're gonna worship. You guys can stand to your feet. I got you standing before noon, feel accomplished. If we can spend a little time, what are we going to do here? I've asked the band if they would just lead us in some worship. Listen, you can worship from where you're at. I would love for a bunch of people maybe to fill this altar too. And what we're going to do is we're going to worship. And then I'm going to believe. And I might even pray. Or not that I have prayer words, but I might go out maybe have a couple other people. <laughs> and I'm going to believe for some encounters with the glory of God. Hey, you might, be, you might be here and say, you know what? I don't even know what you're talking about, really. But I do know that our marriage, our marriage hasn't been that great. I've been struggling in my marriage. And what I need is maybe what you're talking about is the glory of God. You say, you know what? I've been dealing with some depression. I've not been real free. I can't just say, hey, go away. Don't be depressed. No, maybe what you need is to experience the glory of God. Maybe you've been battling that addiction or sexual sin or pornography or anger. 
or envy or jealousy. I don't know what it is. Maybe you just got something on the inside. This morning, what I think could happen here is that you could be forever changed by the glory and the presence of God. And I asked the Father this week, I asked the Father, I said, just like you've done so many times in the Word of God, just like you've done in my life, I said, there's got to be one or two people, I mean, hopefully more, that this morning, that you can be forever changed, forever transformed by encountering the glory of God. And I believe he's going to do that. Forever change. Is there anybody in this room who say, you know, I could probably use a little more freedom. You know, I haven't been changing as much as I would like to. I feel a little stuck in my marriage. I feel a little stuck in my, my spiritual walk. I got some stuff, I'm honest. I'm like, I'm just not free. This morning, uh, whether you're here, guess what? I got faith for even those in the very back of the room that in this house, uh, I had a picture. Much like David said in Psalm 63, I have seen you in the sanctuary. What I, I have beheld your glory and your power. That's what we're going to do here this morning. So what we're going to do here for a second, I'm gonna, we're going to begin to worship. Again, what is worship? We're going to begin to take our mind and our attention. Okay? It's not, hey, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pass you for a second. It's not going to work real well if we start to worship. And you can start thinking about what you got to do here in about 10, 20 minutes for your day. I mean, if you don't want to participate, that's fine. But if you want to do this, you got to lock in. Okay? So as we begin to worship, and as we begin to behold the glory of God and fix our minds, something's going to start to happen. And I am going to believe for some suddenlies of the glory of God and the power of God to come into this room. Are you guys with me? we got some faith in the room? All right, guys, let's go ahead. John. Come on, behold him. Fix your mind, fix your eyes. Your 